Welcome, everybody. It's my pleasure, great pleasure to introduce Daniel Stern from Chicago, and he'll give a lecture on harmonic map methods in spectral geometry. So please, Daniel. All right. So uh, first of all, thanks very much for inviting me to speak and for uh, doing such a nice job getting the hybrid format to work. It's a little strange, but it uh, beats nothing, right? Um, OK, so yeah, I'm talking about some uh, use of harmonic maps and some classical questions of spectral geometry and some more modern questions as well. Um, and everything I'm talking about is joint work with Misha Karpupin at Caltech. And uh, some of it's also joint with uh, Mikhail Nahon and uh, Josef Polterovich at Montreal. Okay, so let's get started with something classical. All right, so our setting is pretty simple. We're working on a two-dimensional surface. So if we have a closed two-dimensional, uh, just uh, let's say Riemannian surface, then we're going to be thinking about the positive spectrum Laplacian, right? whose uh, spectrum is this classical sequence of fundamental geometric invariants. Right? Okay, so if we rescale those invariants by the area, then we get a scale invariant sequence. All right, and we can ask about trying to do some sort of variational theory for these. Okay, so what could we try to do? So uh, it's not hard to see that in any given conformal class, uh, we can always find a sequence of metrics uh, which makes any given eigenvalue uh, 10 to zero, any given uh, you know, area normalized, so scale invariant eigenvalue. So for instance, if we're on S2 and you want to make the first normalized eigenvalue go to zero, you can set up some kind of dumbbell situation where you have a long neck and you can imagine that the first eigenvalue looks sort of constant in one ball, constant in the other ball, and then sort of interpolates in between uh, with small energy. And that's little neck. Okay. Alternatively, uh, we can ask, if given a, say, fixing just the topological type of the surface, can we find a sequence of metrics uh, which make these scale invariant eigenvalues uh, blow up, go to infinity. If we ask an analogous question in higher dimension, the answer is yes. Okay, but it turns out uh, for uh, surfaces, the answer is no. Okay, and so the first observation along these lines goes back uh, 50 years to Hirsch, who showed that uh, for any metric on S2, um, we have that the area normalized first eigenvalue of Laplacian is always bounded above by 8 pi which is exactly the normalized first eigenvalue of the round sphere. And moreover, equality holds only if we're isometric to the round sphere. Okay, so uh, the proof is by now pretty classical, but let's just recall it because it'll motivate a lot of what we're doing subsequently. So first, uh, by uniformization and the fact that S2 just carries one conformal structure, right? we know that uh, we can always find some conformal diffeomorphism from the given metric to the standard one. But uh, Hirsch's main observation is that we have some freedom in how we choose that diffeomorphism. So in particular, we can always post-compose that given diffeomorphism with some conformal automorphism of the standard two-sphere, and that's a large group, right? Um, such that the components of the, uh, the new map given by that composition, still a conformal diffeomorphism, uh, satisfy this balancing condition. So these three scalar functions all have uh, zero average with respect to our given metric, okay? So why is this useful? Well, we know by the variational characterization of the first eigenvalue by Rayleigh quotients, right, that uh, if we have any uh, function of zero average, then the it's L2 norm squared times the first eigenvalue is uh, going to be controlled from above by the, the energy, right? So in particular, applying this to these uh, balanced components of our conformal diffeomorphism, we have that, uh, well, their uh, energy is bounded from below by lambda 1 times their L2 norm. Right? That's just the definition of the first eigenvalue. But in particular, if we sum over i now, well, the sum over i of these psi i squareds, we're a sphere-valued map, so that's just going to be 1. All right, and if we sum over i here, we're just going to get the total energy of that map. But that map is conformal, so this energy is going to be exactly twice the area of the image, which is just the area of the standard 2 sphere, so that's going to be 8 pi. And then uh, since the sum over i of here is just going to be exactly 1, we just get lambda 1 times the area. So we get this really direct proof that the uh, area normalized first eigenvalue is bounded above by 8 pi. And if we chase through, it happens in the case of equality here. So this uh, conformal diffeomorphism has to be by first eigenfunctions of the Laplacian. Uh, it's not hard to see that we have to be uh, isometric. Okay, so that's Hirsch's theorem from 1970. All right, so that's uh, far from the end of the story. So uh, a little while later, uh, Yang and Yao observed that a similar balancing trick for conformal maps from higher genus surfaces to S2 so now we won't be, won't be looking at true conformal maps, right? Not diffeomorphisms, but weakly conformal maps. In particular, we can find by algebraic geometry branched covers, uh, conformal branched covers 
uh, of S2 by these uh, uh, higher genus surfaces. And in particular, we can estimate the degree of these covers in terms of the genus by algebraic geometry. And so they're able to get upper bounds uh, in general on these first eigenvalues, just depending linearly on the genus of the surface. Right? So in particular, uh, we see, you know, an answer to this original question that uh, these first eigenvalues have a universal upper bound uh, depending just on the topology. Okay. All right, so now let's start uh, defining some invariants from this. So let's say we'll fix a conformal structure, some conformal class on a given surface. So then we can define the conformal eigenvalues to be the supremum over all conformal metrics uh, of this normalized kth eigenvalue. Right, so this capital lambda k and that, that conformal class is just this conformal supremum. Uh, and then we can define the topological eigenvalues to be the supremum, uh, not just over a fixed conformal class, but over all metrics on the surface. Right, so um, what we just saw of this Yang and Yao argument tells us that, that these will be finite quantities uh, for any, uh, for k equals one. But in fact, by uh, work of Korovar from the early 90s, we know now that in fact these have to be uh, finite for all k. Okay. So in particular, we start looking at maximizing these quantities, these normalized eigenvalues. That's a well-defined variational problem. And it gives us kind of an interesting way of trying to find some kind of special metrics in our surfaces, um, which aren't given by any kind of curvature condition. So in the case of S2, we saw that we just got back sort of the round metric. But in general, it's not clear if we should get anything close to what we get from uniformization or other, uh, other procedures depending, uh, say, uh, optimal metrics. Okay, so that leads us to this isoparametric problem which is first of all to uh, compute these quantities, and then moreover to sort of characterize those metrics that maximize them. And since we can't say that we have maximizers in general, to at least get some picture of what happens to a sequence of metrics that saturate that bound. And we describe sort of the degeneration of the limit. Okay. So uh, a little after the work with, uh, with Yang, Li and Yao uh, were able to refine Hirsch's technique a little further. So instead of using balanced conformal maps into S2, they're looking at balanced conformal maps into higher dimensional spheres. This is really a key breakthrough, at least the introduction of the conformal volume. So the idea here is that similar to Hirsch's trick, if we start from any branched conformal map from our surface into some sphere Sn, then you can always find again some conformal automorphism of that uh, target standard sphere, such that all of the component functions of the composition are balanced with respect to our given map. So the conformal group is large enough that we can always find such a, uh, such a map. And so in particular, by the same, just uh, summing over the Rayleigh quotients as before, we see that the area of the image, uh, which by uh, conformal conformality, right, has to be the same as the energy, where I'm using uh, my definition of energy here, half the uh, L2 norm of the gradient squared. We see that has to be bounded below by half of this area normalized first time. Okay, so why is this useful? So, uh, well, first of all, we can take the uh, supremum over all conformal automorphisms, of the energy of this composition, right? And since we must have some conformal automorphism for which this holds, uh, we have this inequality here, right? The supremum over all conformal automorphisms is bounded below by half uh, this normalized first eigenvalue. And moreover, this holds for each branch conformal immersion, right? For any given map B from M into SN to start with. And moreover, this holds for any metric G in that conformal class, okay? Because all of these energies are conformally invariant quantities. So what does this tell us? So this tells us that if we define, as Li and Yao did, this nth conformal volume of this conformal class to be the infimum over all these branched conformal immersions into Sn of the supremum of, its of the energy of its composition with the uh, conformal automorphisms of Sn, then this quantity is going to be an upper bound for the uh, normalized first eigenvalue. So in particular, twice this quantity is an upper bound for the normalized first eigenvalue over any metric in this conformal class. Okay, so we have this natural conformal invariant. And moreover, it's a little more work than it was in Hirsch's inequality, but it's not too hard to see that equality holds if and only if uh, G is induced by a minimal immersion into SN by first eigenfunctions. Okay, so this connection that there's some relationship between maximization of these eigenvalues and minimal immersions uh, into higher dimensional spheres, that uh, was a key observation. And so uh, an immediate consequence of this was, well, you can, it's not hard to see that uh, this canonical Veronese minimal embedding of RP2 into S4 is a map by first eigenfunctions of the round metric on RP2. So by the Li Yao theorem, we see that in fact, the round metric on RP2 is also going to maximize the normalized first eigenvalue among all other metrics, okay? And um, though it's not as relevant to the, the story we're talking about today, right, this conformal volume also gives a lower bound for the Wilmore energy 
evolve conformal inversions into SN. Okay, so in particular, links maximization of this uh, lambda one bar quantity with minimization of W. We're not going to be talking much about one more energy today, but this is a, you know, a very important feature of the, the conformal volumes. Okay. Great, so we're in the 80s now, and we've computed this normalized burst eigenvalue max for uh, S2 and RP2, where we only have one conformal class to deal with anyway. Okay, so let's uh, go to a surface of higher genus where we have some more conformal classes to play with. So back in the uh, in 73 now, Berger was reading, I think, Hirsch's work, and got interested in this question of uh, maximizing the first eigenvalue in the torus. And so um, by playing around just with the flat metrics, he was led to conjecture that uh, the maximum should be achieved by the flat equilateral torus, right, where we're uh, taking C and modding out by the lattice generated by one, and then a half plus root three over two is uh, I, right? So that, uh, our uh, fundamental domain is this rhombus. Okay. So um, while Lee and Yao's results show us easily that this metric maximizes its conformal class because we can find a minimal inversion by first eigenfunctions into the five sphere, it's not clear a priori that it maximizes among uh, all metrics, right? We only know that it maximizes among conformal metrics. So the full conjecture remained open until the mid 90s, about 25 years ago. Okay, but then uh, in 96, Nadarashvili came along and, and proved this conjecture. So he showed in particular that the topological supremum of the first eigenvalue in the torus is exactly eight pi squared over root three. It's given by the equilateral flat torus. Okay. So uh, the proof is kind of distinct from these previous proofs for S2 and RP2, because it actually relies on the existence theory for maximizing metrics. So what was the idea? So uh, first, uh, Nadarashvili gave this analytic argument to argue that uh, the maximizing metric does in fact exist. Okay, and then he showed, and this was sort of observed in some forms by Berger back in the 70s even, uh, that any such maximizing metric has to be induced by a minimal immersion into SN by first eigenfunctions. Okay, so now we reduce this to a problem of studying minimal immersions of tori into spheres by first eigenfunctions. And this was actually solved earlier, this classification of these objects by uh, El Sufi and Elias. So by El Sufi and Elias, we know that in fact the only possibilities uh, are the equilateral torus T2 and S5 and the Clifford torus T2 and S3. And then it's just a matter of comparing uh, lambda one bar with these metrics, right? So this was the path to, uh, to Nadarashvili's for J's conjecture. Okay. So uh, this then stimulated a lot of work understanding the existence theory in general. Okay, so now there's uh, sort of a big literature has grown up around this problem of determining when the maximizing metrics exist, what do they look like, and when they don't exist, you know, what happens in the degeneration. Okay. And the, both the conformal problem and the global problem uh, are, are very interesting. So let's focus on the conformal problem first. So um, the first person to resolve this was uh, Petrides, I think around 2014. Now there's sort of various other groups floating around, um, but uh, this was sort of the, the first big, uh, big positive result. So uh, we have the following setup. So for each conformal structure on a closed surface, we know that uh, if the kth uh, supremal eigenvalue conformally is strictly greater than the k minus one pi eigenvalue plus eight pi. And in fact, non-strict inequality always holds. Um, so as long as the quality doesn't hold, then there exists a harmonic map into Sn uh, for some n, which you can uh, determine, uh, whose energy is exactly half this k eigenvalue, and such that the uh, metric given by, um, we can just choose a conformal metric, which views the energy density of this map as constant. That metric is gonna maximize uh, the normalized kth eigenvalue of the conformal class. Okay, so in particular, with respect to this, uh, this uh, metric G bar, the coordinates of B are first eigenfunctions. Now, I've put uh, metric and scare quotes here um, because, of course, this map a priori, this harmonic map, can't have zeros, um, in which case, uh, you know, this is not an honest metric, right? But uh, fortunately, I mean, we know what the zeros of the gradients of harmonic maps look like, and somehow, at worst, this is a metric with some finite number of conical singularities corresponding to the zeros of that uh, of deep bottom. Okay. So uh, in particular, for the first eigenvalue, um, the treatise showed that the strict inequality, which in this case just says that lambda one is strictly greater than eight pi, always holds, right? And this is a, a key result here. I mean, it's somehow analogous if you're interested in Imabe type problems to the oban shane estimate, right? Telling us that uh, if we're not on the round sphere, our Yamabe invariant has to be strictly uh, less in that case, right? So here, this is somehow telling us that as long as we're not the round sphere, um, 
then our uh, informal first eigenvalue has to be strictly greater than that of the round sphere. This is going to prevent some kind of bubbling of generations from taking maximizing sequence. Okay, so in particular, maximization of lambda one bar is going to uh, you know, work. And it's going to associate to each conformal class some distinguished harmonic map into SN. Okay, when K is uh, two or higher, so we're looking at higher eigenvalues, um, then in fact, it is possible for equality to hold in that uh, lambda K is lambda K minus one plus K pi, and this corresponds to some kind of bubbling behavior. And this is something that is observed in cases. Um, so for instance, the maximizers for uh, the second eigenvalue on uh, S2 or RP2, and in fact, higher eigenvalues as well, uh, you know they have this kind of bubbling behavior. Well, let's see, there's a question in the chat. What is dimension N in these results? Okay, great. So there's um, classical results um, going back to the 70s and 80s, I think. I think starting with work of Chung, I think maybe some of our organizers were involved in this as well, um, where you can estimate the um, maximum multiplicity of k eigenfunctions functions um, for a surface in terms of its topology. Okay, and so uh, these, uh, these n correspond to, I guess, uh, one plus or you know, one the maximum multiplicity of, of the k eigenfunctions functions minus one. Yeah. Thanks for the question. Great. All right. So uh, that's the existence theory in the conformal case. Right. So if we have the existence theory in the conformal case, well, that reduces the global maximization problem to sort of a, a maximization problem over tight Muller space now. So in particular, it's a finite dimensional problem. Still very non-trivial, um, but uh, for k equals one, uh, Henrik Matthias and Anna Zippert uh, were able to show compactness for a maximizing sequence of conformal classes. So the key point here is they're able to rule out some other generations of the boundary of type Muller space, and uh, combining this with the conformal existence results, uh, they're able to show that in any closed surface, uh, there in fact does exist a globally uh, lambda one maximizing metric. Again, this may have some conical singularities corresponding to zeros of these maps, uh, induced by a branched minimal immersion. Was here by first eigenfunctions. Okay. Um, so we have the existence result for lambda one, and it's not really well understood yet the global existence problem for a higher eigenvalues again because you have um, bubbling issues, and then for the global setting you can also have other you can imagine other generations happening in type of space. I think it's not really uh, understood yet uh, what we even expect the maximization problem to look like for higher eigenvalues in cases other than S two. All right, so in particular, we see that for every conformal structure on a surface, maximization of these lambda k, as long as we don't have these bubbling phenomena, uh, is going to give rise to some harmonic sphere-valued map whose energy corresponds exactly to the half of these, uh, these uh, conformal supreme length these eigenvalues. And moreover, uh, from this harmonic map, we recover uh, the maximizing metric. Okay, so this intimate connection between harmonic maps and, uh, um, and these maximizing metrics. So recall, I, I'm using this term harmonic, I, I should, should be familiar to everyone here, but recall that a sphere-valued map is harmonic if and only if it's a critical point of the Dirichlet energy um, among maps restricted to take values in the sphere, right? And so equivalently, um, you know, in, in equations we can express this in the fact that Laplace unit V is given by the energy density squared times V. And remember, of course, that in uh, dimension two, right, the Dirichlet energy is a conformal invariant, and so this harmonic map being a harmonic map is a conformally invariant problem. Okay, so this somehow doesn't fail. Doesn't see a specific metric in formal class. Okay. All right, so if they're critical points of the Dirichlet energy, then we know that these harmonic maps in principle should arise from some kind of variational methods uh, for the energy functional in the space of sphere value maps. So uh, it's kind of clear from immediate consideration that they won't be minimizers, but we can hope that maybe these arise from some kind of force theoretic uh, or min max methods. And that was the, uh, the question that sort of initially led to this collaboration with Asia Krapukin, which is just this. Uh, uh, innocent question of whether these harmonic maps associated to maximization of these eigenvalues can in fact be produced by some sort of natural or canonical variational methods uh, for the Dirichlet energy of these sphere value maps. Okay. And uh, you know, initially this is just kind of a, a curiosity. If we have these critical points of the uh, of the Dirichlet energy arising naturally for geometric reasons, one would hope to have some nice characterization of them. Uh, but of course, um, you know, we've seen over the last decade, especially with uh, the resolution of the Wilmore conjecture, that having variational characterizations of some nice critical point uh, in geometry, right, sometimes gives us more information um, you know, than we were initially hoping for. So uh, let's see. So that's uh, part of the idea. Okay. 
So for the first two eigenvalues in this first paper, we're able to say the answer is yes. So we can relate these uh, informal supremum for the first and second eigenvalues to some natural min-max problem uh, for the Dirichlet energy on the spaces screwed value maps. And uh, using this min-max characterization, we're actually able to uh, get some slightly stronger properties for these conformal maxima. Okay, we'll uh, come to that in a moment. Let's see, any questions so far? Okay, let's go ahead. So uh, let's see, I'm going to focus on the first eigenvalue. And that's what makes it prettiest. So what's the conformal, the uh, min-max characterization of this first conformal eigenvalue? So let's consider the following setup. So if n is at least two, we think about maps to the two sphere or higher, we're going to consider a weakly continuous family of maps parameterized by the closed n plus one ball, right? So sending points in the closed n plus one ball to, to maps in w12 to the n sphere. Okay. Um, and we're only requiring they be weakly continuous. They need not be strongly continuous uh, as a map from the n plus one into w12. And they satisfy this boundary condition that uh, f sub a is exactly the constant map to a when a is this boundary point in the n sphere. Okay. So in particular, um, as an exercise, if we require that this were continuous, say, as a map to C0, then no such family could exist. And if we required that it were uh, strongly continuous with W12, a harder exercise uh, would be to show that, again, no such family exists. Okay. So what's an example, since I just told you that uh, if we put too many continuity constraints, these guys don't exist. So for instance, one can take F sub A to be G sub A composed of phi where phi is some branch conformal immersion that we're fixing from our surface into Sn. And G sub A of X, well, this is a family generating uh, the conformal automorphisms of Sn modulo isomerals. So in particular, uh, modulo rotations of Sn, this class of families is going to include these uh, families uh, whose min-max energies Li and Yao use to define the conformal volume. Okay. Well, for any such family, just going back to this general setup now, um, if we take the map sending a point in Vn plus 1 to the average of that map as a vector in Rn plus 1, uh, well, then it's easy to see that it's continuous, right? Because these are weakly continuous uh, functions of beta fa. And moreover, it obviously, by this boundary condition, restricts the identity uh, from the boundary Sn to itself. So in particular, just by elementary topology, there must be some A in the interior of that ball for which uh, the coordinates of this map fa are balanced. Okay. So we're just uh, just replaying uh, Hirsch's greatest hits here. All right, so in particular, um, for any such family, right, we see that um, uh, right for this uh, point where we have balancing, then again, by Hirsch's trick, uh, this lambda one times area is gonna be bounded above by uh, twice this energy quantity. So in particular, if we uh, define a min-max energy to be the infimum over all such uh, families F, of the supremum over all uh, A in the ball of the energy, then um, we see that, well, for any metric, um, this, uh, this normalized first eigenvalue is bounded above by twice this energy, this min max energy. Again, just because we always have some point A uh, in the ball, which is uh, inequality holds. And uh, moreover, well, these energies, since the Dirichlet energy is conformally invariant, um, it's clear these min max energies are also uh, conformally invariant. So we end up with this conformal invariant sits in between uh, half this normalized first eigenvalue and the conformal volume. Okay, so in particular, um, whenever we have equality in Li Yao's inequality for the conformal volume and the first eigenvalue, um, then we'll have equality for this min-max energy as well. But in general, we just know that it's going to sit somewhere in between. So in practice, um, for analytic reasons, we offer a slightly different definition, because if we're actually trying to carry out um, min-max methods for this sort of Dirichlet energy, which is a uh, formally invariant functional without a good Poisson-Hill condition, on this space, this space is weakly continuous uh, maps into W12, uh, then somehow classical min-max methods would not deliver us a uh, critical point. But somehow there's a nice relaxation procedure uh, via Ginsburg-Landau type perturbations, uh, which I won't get into for the purpose of this talk, but it's, it's easy to sort of come up with uh, a slight tweaking of this definition uh, such that it satisfies all the same properties and actually gives us a critical. Okay. Right, so in particular, after uh, tweaking slightly the definition of these uh, min-max energies EN, it's not hard to see that uh, the min-max energies are in fact achieved 
by a harmonic map, possibly together with some bubble train of a harmonic maps from S2 and S3. So the following to start with. So uh, for every n at least two, we know that there's going to exist, and for any you know, fixed formal structure, we know there's going to exist some harmonic maps from M into Sn, and uh, some possible, possibly also some harmonic maps from S2 into Sn, some bubbles, such that the total energy realizes this min-max energy that we define. And more, we have this Morse index bound, so we have this n plus one parameter min-max, and we can show that uh, the, uh, as critical points of the energy functional, the Morse index of this, uh, all of these maps together sums up to less than equal n. Okay. So, uh, all right, so we have this map energy achieved by some map possibly with some bubbles. Um, but in fact, we can say a little more if n is sufficiently large. Okay, so first of all, we have this uh, classic result by El Sufi, which tells us that for any non-trivial harmonic map from a surface into Sn, um, its energy index, Morse index, is at least n minus two. Right, and the quality implies that you're in fact an equatorial S2 sitting inside of Sn. All right, so by the sort of classical structure theory for harmonic maps from S2 to Sn, and some subsequent work by my collaborator, Misha Kapukin, um, we know in fact that if, uh, if we have a harmonic map from S2 to Sn, um, and the Morse index is at most n plus one, then phi has to be an equatorial embedding. So not only does being n minus two imply that you're an equatorial embedding as in this El Sufi theorem, but if your domain is actually S2, uh, there's a, a larger gap. Okay. And uh, finally, this, uh, this result of Petrinus, which I mentioned before, which tells you that if m has positive genus, or you know, is also uh, you know, hard to uh, or something orientable, then uh, this normalized first eigenvalue in the conformal class the supreme is strictly greater than a pi. Okay. So putting this together, well, what do we know about our, our maps? We know that the sum of their energies is bigger than or equal to this uh, uh, half this normalized first eigenvalue, which is strictly bigger than four pi. So we can't have the situation where we have just one equatorial bubble, because okay? that would violate the treatises inequality. However, um, this inequality of Sufi, well, since we're bounded above by n plus one in the total index, and each map should have index at least n minus two, it's clear that for n sufficiently large, we'll have at most just one bubble or just the, the map we're looking for. Okay. But if we have just one bubble, then finally this result of uh, Barbosa and Garfuga and various other people um, tells us that uh, if the energy index of that bubble is at most n plus one, which you know it has to be, then it's equatorial. But we just said that can happen by the three. This is inequality. So to make a long story short, um, for every conformal structure, uh, other than the round sphere, but the round sphere is covered by classical methods. Um, we see that if n is in fact strictly greater than five is large enough, then there exists a harmonic map m to Sn achieving this min-max energy uh, of index, uh, Morse index at most n plus one. Okay, so it's not just achieved by map with some bubbles, but in fact for n sufficiently large it's achieved uh, by an honest harmonic map. Okay. So now we would like to show that if n is sufficiently large, so in, this in general should be larger than just this five, um, then in fact, uh, we have equality here. So this in fact is not just some harmonic map, but in fact the harmonic map realizing the maximal metric of the lambda one in this conformal class. Okay, so what's the idea? So for these harmonic maps, notice we can again consider these uh, associated metrics. And again, these aren't quite metrics around the zeros of the maps, but that doesn't really matter too much. Uh, which view their energy density as constant. So in this metric, just by looking at what the uh, harmonic map equation says, the components of uh, Bn of this map are going to be Laplace eigenfunctions with common eigenvalue lambda is two. Okay. So one can define this quantity called the spectral index, which just tells you where this eigenvalue two falls in the spectrum of the Laplacian for the degenerate metric. Okay, and so equivalently, this has a conformally invariant definition uh, where for any g in this uh, conformal class, it's just going to be index of the Schrodinger operator given by Laplacian minus the index. Okay, so why do we care about the spectral index? Well, if uh, k is the, the spectral index, then we know that uh, lambda bar k is exactly twice the energy density, or excuse me, twice the min-max energy, which we know is bounded below by this capital lambda one. So if we can show that k is one, that the spectral index is one, so two is a first eigenvalue, the Laplacian of this, uh, this metric. Then, in fact, we have, um, by definition of this uh, supremum, that bar lambda one is bounded above by this capital lambda one as well. 
And we end up with this desired inequality. The min max energy is exactly, there's a two there that should be a one half. The min max energy is exactly one half. So this will also bring them a lambda one. And more of these maps are the ones whose metrics achieve the uh, maximum. Okay, so how could we go about doing that? So to show that this index is one, for n sufficiently large, uh, we first know that these energies are non-increasing in n, that's easy. And then there's a technical part we deduce by a contradiction argument, I'm going to start here because I have a footnote later, um, that there exists some n, depending just to the conformal class, such that for all little n sufficiently large, maybe we should use two letters there, that these SN valued maps are given by harmonic maps into a lower dimensional sphere whose dimension is fixed by the, um, by the conformal class. And then just uh, the equatorial embedding of that lower dimensional sphere into SN. So what we're saying is, in fact, more generally, what we prove is that if we have a sequence of harmonic maps into spheres whose dimension our a priori is going to infinity, then in fact, if there's a uniform energy bound, then they in fact have to all lie in a lower dimensional sphere uh, of fixed dimension. Okay, so energy bounds somehow imply different bounds on the dimension of the target. Okay, so, uh, so that's a lemma. More technical one for the paper. Okay, so now if we uh, take this for granted, and if we compare the Morse indices of these maps, so the, the full map Vn to the higher dimensional sphere, and then the Morse index of this map uh, to the lower dimensional sphere, then one finds that the difference is going to be exactly the difference from little n and this fixed big n of the spectral index of, uh, of this map V sub n. Okay. So in particular, just forgetting about this uh, Morse index, this psi n part, because we know that's at least not negative, right? Then we know that n plus one, uh, we know that by the min max characterization, right, that's gonna be bigger than or equal to this uh, Morse index of the Vn. But we see that's bounded below by little n minus this fixed big n times uh, the spectral index. So in particular, um, if the spectral index is one, or excuse me, if the spectral index is larger than one, we would get a contradiction as soon as little n is bigger than this fixed two n plus one. Okay, so in fact, the spectral index has to be one, and we get this desired, uh, desired equality. So returning to the star here, I just want to say, um, you know, so our contradiction argument for proving this lemma, we assume we have a sequence of maps that has this behavior. So we have, um, you know, taking values in higher and higher SN, and uh, you know, not they're not taking values in a lower dimensional sphere. So in particular, the dimension of the space spanned by their coordinate functions is going to infinity. Well, then this somehow tells you that these Schrodinger operators associated with these maps have a kernel whose dimension is going to infinity. But then by some bubbling analysis, you can say that you can arrive at a Schrodinger operator on, say, the original surface, maybe you need some spheres, uh, who also has to have all of its spectrum uh, collapse below zero. Right? But then you can show that the Schrodinger operator is nice enough so this doesn't happen. Okay, so it's kind of a fun argument, um, but, uh, but it would be nice, and I think in principle, some such argument should exist, but we didn't find it, to get an effective geometric proof of this stabilization property of harmonic maps of bound energy. So given an energy bound, uh, can you say sort of what the maximum dimension is of the target sphere in which you're linearly equal? I think it's an interesting problem that we uh, you know, thought about briefly as we were doing this, but then we had the, the ugly argument that worked and eventually just thought ahead with that. All right. So now we know this, uh, this thing we set out to prove, right? So for n sufficiently large, these min-max energies are in fact exactly half of these conformal supremum. And uh, moreover, the, uh, the metrics associated with these min-max harmonic maps are exactly the ones that maximize uh, this lambda one bar. Okay, so that's fun to know. Um, so we also find some similar min-max characterization for lambda two, but the construction doesn't seem quite as geometrically natural. So somehow it, uh, it works for all the applications we have, but uh, I'm not gonna bother presenting it here because I don't think ultimately it's the right way to think about this for generalizing it to higher eigenvalues. And I do believe this should work for higher eigenvalues. Okay. I'll mention that in that case that we do expect bubbles in general. So these lemmas about just having a single harmonic map. Now instead we'll have a harmonic map together with some bubbles that we can carry. It's the higher eigenvalue from. And I'll stick to just the first eigenvalue. All right, so uh, uh, you know, as a byproduct, we get a new proof of the existence of these maximizing metrics. Okay, but in fact, we get uh, a little bit more. So uh, before I go on to the questions. Okay. 
All right, so if we're looking at the variational theory for these normalized eigenvalues, then one of the first things you realize if you're trying to, say, solve the maximization problem by direct methods is that it's natural to try to extend these notions of the uh, you know, first eigenvalue to the Laplacian to metrics of lower regularity. Right? So in particular, since conformal metrics of fixed area just correspond to, say, smooth functions, uh, smooth positive functions of fixed L1 norm, then uh, you're naturally led to consider some kind of spectrum uh, generalizing the Laplacian spectrum to the weak closure of these guys. So in particular, to non-negative radon measures. Okay. So given some uh, conformal class, some radon measure on our surface, we can define a first eigenvalue, which is generalizing the first eigenvalue of Laplacian, by just this uh, the same Rayleigh quotient definition we had before, where now the only difference, right, so the Dirichlet energy term, that's a conformal invariance, that just depends on our conformal structure. But now we ask that we have zero average respect to that measure mu, and that the the uh, L2 part of the Rayleigh quotient, the denominator, right, is now L2 with respect to uh, this given measure. Okay. And then given these uh, first eigenvalues, we can also define these normalized first eigenvalues, so we can normalize by the mass of that measure. Right. Okay. And I'll note that fact that you know a similar characterization works for um, for higher eigenvalues as well, which be the min-max characterization via the Rayleigh quotients. All right, so in particular, right, if mu is just the, um, say, rho squared times the volume measure of a fixed metric, or rho is just some positive function, then we recover just the uh, Laplace eigenvalues, this conformal metric, rho squared. Right? Um, but the definition is a little more interesting than just this. It includes some other sort of natural geometric spectrum. So uh, one of the most important examples is the Steklov spectrum. So if M is a surface of boundary, and mu is just the length measure of that boundary, then this first eigenvalue applied to that measure mu is exactly the first Steklov eigenvalue of mg. So that is the first eigenvalue of this Dirichlet and Neumann map, where we take a map, a function of the boundary, take its harmonic extension, and then send that to its uh, the normal derivative of the harmonic extension of the boundary. Okay. So not only is this a, a classical uh, you know, uh, spectrum of some nice geometric pseudo differential operator, but uh, in fact, it has a nice story similar the story of maximization for Laplace and eigenvalues. So this is more recent, but uh, within the last uh, 10 years or so, maybe a little longer, Fraser and Shane started this program of studying the variational theory for these Steklov eigenvalues normalized by the length. Okay, on surfaces of boundary. And in particular, they showed that a maximizing metric has to be induced by a free boundary minimal immersion into some Euclidean ball. Okay, so it's an interesting analogy with the maximization problem for the Laplace spectrum on closed surfaces. We're getting minimal immersions into spheres in the maximizing phase. Okay. And in fact, uh, just last year, the existence of maximizing metrics for these sigma one corresponding to some branch pre boundary minimal versions uh, was finally confirmed by uh, Matthias and Dimitris. Okay. There's this interesting analogous story on surfaces of the boundary that fits into this uh, eigenvalues and measures framework. Okay. All right. So if we have an arbitrary rate on measure now, then these, uh, these, uh, Substitute for the Laplacian spectrum can be very badly behaved. So, for instance, if we have just a Dirac mass, the first eigenvalue is infinity. That's not going to be very useful for maximization problems. Um, and if we have, say, something like a Dirac mass plus an absolutely continuous measure, the first eigenvalue is going to be zero. Okay, so if we just take measures willy nilly, uh, we'll get some uh, some strange things popping up. Okay, but let's uh, consider a type of measure which, for which the spectrum will be sort of well behaved and what we would expect from Laplacian spectrum. So we'll call a radon measure mu admissible if the natural map from, say, C1 of M into L2 of that measure extends to a compact map. So in particular, continuous, but also compact map from W12 of our ambient space into uh, L2 of mu. Okay. So, um, right, so for just the usual volume measures, this is just uh, the standard uh, map, which is also so plus spaces. But uh, moreover, let's say if mu is this link measure on the boundary, and this is compactness of the trace map, W12 into L2 of the boundary. So it contains a lot of these ge actual real geometric cases that we care about. Okay, and it's uh, you know, an elementary exercise in functional analysis. to see that the spectrum of such a measure is sort of what we would expect from the Laplacian spectrum, right? Or a spectrum of a nice pseudo differential operator. So it's, it's going to be in particular uh, non negative, uh, discrete, and it's going to go to infinity as k goes to infinity. And moreover, the eigenvalues are realized by some eigenfunctions. Right? So this is what it means to be an eigenfunction for these measures. Okay. 
So uh, in particular, these are somehow the natural measures that we really expect to see something that behaves uh, like the Laplacian spin. All right, so what we show using the min-max characterization is that in fact, for any admissible mu, so any mu satisfying this criterion, uh, we have that the normalized first eigenvalue is bounded above by the uh, maximum conformal eigenvalue over the smooth matrix. And moreover, equality holds only if mu is uh, uh, smooth maximizing that. Okay, so uh, a priori it wasn't clear, right, whether these um, whether these uh, maxim maximization problems, these admissible measures, would give you something different, something of uh, you know with the larger eigenvalue. Um, so we show not only is it uh, bounded, but in fact we have this rigidity, or if you like a regularity result, which tells you that an honest maximizer um, has to in fact be a smooth maximizer. Okay, and um, maybe I'll note that if you look at the if you look at sort of just critical points, this normalized first eigenvalue measures, you can get things that aren't smooth. So it's not as though you expect to get a regularity result just by looking at sort of uh, you know, the critical point condition and deriving some regularity theory. It's, it's really it's, uh, the regularity factor is strictly for, for maximizers. Okay. So um, this has some implications for the Steklov problem. I'll come back to that towards the end of the talk. First, let's uh, pop over to a more recent application of the min-max characterization. Which is a question, you know, so we've looked at variants of this question, I think, already in this conference, where we have a nice rigidity result in geometric analysis. We often want to know if we have any uh, flexibility or stability, right? So if we know that, you know, some, in this case, some maximizer for a geometric quantity uh, has a nice strict characterization, can we say that uh, if we're close to being maximum, that we're somehow close uh, to the maximizer, right? So in this case, let's say if, um, you know, we have a metric, or more generally one of these measures, which the first eigenvalue is close to the conformal or the global maximum. Is there any nice sense in which we can say that we're close to the maximizing metric, right, to the maximizing metric? Okay. And so uh, we do get a positive answer. So we find out that the correct notion of distance will come from this W minus one, two norm. So in other words, the uh, W12 dual norm on say the space of measures um, for an appropriate choice of background. So for instance, for S2, for the classical Hirsch inequality, we get the following quantitative version. So this is with uh, uh, Misha Karpukin, then we got the Hon and Joseph Polterovich. Um, so if we take, say, the standard metric on S2, then for any admissible measure, we normalize the first eigenvalue to have two, so this just rescale it so this is true. Then there exists some conformal automorphism of S2, such that uh, 8 pi minus the normalized first eigenvalue, so the gap, the distance from being maximum, is uh, uh, bounded below by twice um, the conformal push forward of mu by this conformal automorphism times the minus the area measure of this, uh, this standard metric in the W minus one two norm for the standard metric and uh, then we square. Okay, so um, I'll uh, describe in a moment why this why this holds. And in fact, this doesn't require the min max characterization; it just requires squeezing a little bit more out of the uh, the classical version. But let me comment for now that both the uh, the space W minus one two and the exponent two are optimal. Okay, so right, when I say the space W minus one two is optimal, if you look at any of sort of the familiar Sobolev spaces, uh, this is the, the best one in which this inequality holds. So it's possible there's some more exotic space unrelated to Sobolev spaces um, where you can uh, get a similar estimate. But as far as we know, among sort of the, the, the layman spaces, uh, this is the, uh, this seems to be optimal. Okay. So um, we're able to get some similar quantitative stability theorems for the global maximization problem on RP2, uh, on the two torus, and on the Klein bottle. And um, in particular, these are all the topologies for which the maximum has been determined, except for the genus 2 case, where the maximum is degenerate and it's realized by a branched cover of S2. So in the genus 2 case, somehow these, uh, these inequalities of Yang and Yao are actually the ones that achieve the maximum. And that one somehow isn't really amenable to our methods as far as the quantitative inequalities go, which is strange. But, um, so for instance, we can make another Schwili's theorem quantitative by saying that for any metric G on T2, there exists a metric G not isometric to the, uh, the equilateral torus, such that the metric norm, the given metric normalized by first eigenvalue uh, is, uh, you know, within uh, uh, the gap uh, from the, the canonical metric, the equilateral metric, right, for this inequality. And moreover, you can replace this, you know, I'm phrasing this for a metric G, 
but you can also replace this with a conformal class and some uh, measures, right? So we weaken the, the requirement to be an honest metric. Yep. So for a general conformal structure or for a general uh, surface where we don't have the examples explicitly, we don't have the quantitative stability in general, um, although we expect it should hold in uh, many examples. Um, but we do have the following qualitative stability result. So uh, let me mention that, you know, it's not clear a priori from anything I've told you so far, and in particular, I'm not sure it was even uh, believed by experts for a while, that if you take a maximizing sequence of metrics, or say a maximizing sequence of measures, that you actually get in general convergence, uh, even in the weak sense, to an honest maximizer. Right, so it's not clear that sort of a naive direct method would actually produce a maximizing metric in general. So, um, but it turns out it does. So if we fix a background metric, um, doesn't matter which, just fix one in the conformal class. Then for any sequence of uh, admissible measures, which the normalized first eigenvalue approaches the maximum, then uh, though we don't estimate the rate in general, we can say that in fact they, these measures will converge in W minus one, two, to the, uh, the maximizing measures, in particular the volume measure of the conformally uh, maximizing measure. Okay. And, uh, okay, so uh, let me now finally say a little bit about the proof. So to cover the case of, of arbitrary conformal class, um, we need this min-max characterization. And the output of the min-max characterization that's relevant here is that for any admissible, admissible measure mu, we can say that there exists a sphere-valued map to a sphere of fixed dimension based on the conformal structure whose uh, mu average is zero and uh, whose energy is bounded from above by, by lambda one. All right, so here we're using the fact that this min-max characterization um, we said that, you know, by virtue of how the min-max families were set up, uh, for any given metric, you could always find a map with zero average. But that's true if you replace that metric by uh, some measure. We can always find, for an admissible measure, one of these maps such that it has mu zero average. And then since these min-max energies correspond to this lambda one um, for n sufficiently large, uh, that's where this result comes from. Okay. So again, just first respect, apply to this min-max characterization. So uh, why is this useful? So for such a map U, for any V, say in W12 of M to Rn plus one, we can see that the difference of the L2 pairing of the derivatives of DU and DV minus the first eigenvalue of mu times just the pairing of mu and the respect to D mu. So right, so this quantity which would vanish uh, if and only if uh, U were first eigenfunctions for this measure mu is bounded from above by, well, first of all, the uh, derivative of V and L2 um, for that given test map, and then the square root of the gap of the energy of the map U from the first eigenvalue of the measure. Right, since it's balanced, we know that this is non-negative, but moreover, since we have this inequality, we know that this gap is bounded from above by the gap that we want to measure between a lambda one bar and the maximum lambda one. So, and this is not really a, a deep inequality. If you play with it, you'll realize that in fact, it's just uh, an application of Cauchy-Schwartz essentially. Um, if you restrict to V of zero average, then this becomes a non-negative quadratic form. And it's easy to see where this comes from. So this is a straightforward inequality. And if we apply it to cases where the maximizer is known, we have explicit maximizers and we sort of understand um, how these maximizers sit inside nice families like the conformal families of Bian Yao or the conformal automorphisms used by Hirsch, then just sort of plugging those families in um, gives us these quantitative inequalities. In general, um, for an arbitrary conformal class, we have to use the, the existence of these maps, uh, which you know, is a consequence of the first min max characterization. And um, so then this tells us that, well, okay, we have a maximizing sequence, then we get this corresponding sequence of maps which in some weak sense are looking like first, eigen first eigenfunctions for these measures. And in particular, we, it follows uh, with a little work that they're going to converge weakly, this is a harmonic map. And then if you dig into the bubbling analysis, um, so what's happening with energy concentrates, then using the fact that they're almost first eigenvalues, oh, excuse me, almost first eigenfunctions, um, it's not just enough to know that they're, you know, sort of a Palais male sequence for, uh, for the energy because those can be uh, quite poorly behaved in general. But because they're almost first eigenfunctions, we can then show um, that they, in fact, have to strongly converge to one of these uh, harmonic maps associated to uh, 
uh, the maximization problem for lambda one. And it's not hard to deduce then from this inequality again that that forces the measures to converge to um, one to maximize the measures. Okay. And um, okay, so we're also then able to get similar w minus one two converged results the globally maximizing case. And in that case, we don't really have to do anything new on the qualitative side um, because now uh, we just combine this compactness result in the conformal class with the uh, compactness results for maximizing conformal classes by Matthias and Zipper. So now we don't have to add too much new there on the analysis side. All right. So those are some of the main contributions of this um, recent paper which came out uh, this past week. So this is kind of, you know, a satisfactory answer to this little analytic question about if we have, um, you know, uh, the eigenvalues close to the maximum, is the associated metric close to the maximum metric? So we get kind of a, a more or less complete answer for this uh, stability for the isoperimetric inequality, these first eigenvalues. And in fact, for the second as well, although now things get more complicated because, again, you have these bubbling phenomena. So the results don't look quite as nice, but somehow we get the, uh, the output that the behavior of an arbitrary maximizing sequence mirrors that of sort of the distinguished maximizing sequences found by Petritus and others. We can describe the degeneration into sort of bubbles in a precise way. So the first eigenvalue case is clear to the state. Okay, so that's the story there. Um, so all right, so this kind of analytic results, let's take it back to something nice and sort of classical and geometric. So uh, let's go back to this Steklov maximization problem. So uh, let's note by sigma one of gamma r, say the supremum of the normalized first Steklov eigenvalue over all metrics g on the surface of genus gamma and r bound components. All right, so by uh, Fraser Shane and Matthias and Petridis, you know these are going to be achieved by some free boundary minimal surfaces. Euclidean law. Okay, so as a consequence of this rigidity regularity theorem for admissible measures in the first paper, if we're applying it to the length measures for appropriate collections of curves inside our closed surfaces, it's not hard to show that this uh, first Steklov eigenvalue for genus gamma and any number of boundary components is strictly bounded from above by lambda one of gamma. Okay, so the maximization problem for Steklov for fixed genus and any number of boundary components is always bounded above by the Laplacian maximization problem for the same genus. Okay. So uh, on the other hand, uh, around the same time last year, uh, Alexander Giroir and Jean Lagasse showed that um, by homogenization, homogenization construction, that one can always find, say, um, in any given fixed uh, surface, say, a sequence of domains inside by sort of excising um, a large collection of disks that are whose total area is going to zero but are becoming dense in the appropriate way. You can find a sequence of domains whose Steklov spectrum uh, converges to the Laplacian spectrum. And so as a result, um, we're able to conclude that the limit of these uh, Steklov maxima, sigma one of gamma r, as r goes to infinity, as the number of boundary components goes to infinity, is bounded from below by lambda one of gamma. And so in particular, combining those two statements, we see that this, uh, this sigma one of gamma r, this Steklov maxima, are converging as r goes to infinity to the uh, this uh, global maximum for the uh, first Laplacian eigenvalue. Okay. So uh, once these results started coming out, a, a folklore conjecture quickly sort of grew up, which said that, okay, well then the, uh, if this is the case, we have this convergence at the level of the numbers of these spectra, then maybe the, the maximizing metrics should also converge, right? So you ask if the step law maximizing metrics, these free boundary minimal surfaces corresponding to the sigma one of gamma r, uh, in fact limit in any reasonable sense to the, uh, the lambda one maximizing metric on the closed surface of genus gamma, as r goes to Okay, and building on these, uh, these stability results uh, with Nahon and Volterovich, uh, Misha Karpukin and I have been able to, to say this is true. So the free boundary minimal surfaces in Vn plus one, uh, which achieve this maximum sigma one of gamma r, converge at least as barifolds as r goes to infinity to the closed minimal surface in Sn, realizing lambda one of gamma. Okay, so um, I'll try to make a few remarks here. So being a minimal surface, uh, free boundary minimal surface in the ball, uh, a priori looks very different from being a minimal surface in the in the sphere, the boundary, right? But in fact, both satisfy the condition that if you push them around by diffeomorphisms of the ball, which fix the boundary sphere, then they're going to be critical points for the area functional under those kind of perturbations. And that's why you're allowed to sort of 
achieve these closed guys in the sphere as verifold limits of free boundary minimal guys. On the other hand, it's, it's immediately clear that we can't expect uh, anything as good as, say, C1 convergence, even if we can fill in these boundaries in some clever way, um, because they're you know, going to be orthogonal to the boundary sphere. They're converging to something which is tangent to it. So we have this verifold convergence. Um, we can't get anything as good as C1 convergence, because that just that simply ruled out a priori. Um, of course, it'd be interesting to know if one fits with refine these things. Um, so what's the idea here, right, is we are somehow able to conformally identify these sigma-1 maximizing surfaces of boundary with domains inside the closed surface. And then using the global stability result, um, we're able to say that the boundary length measures have to converge in W minus 1, 2 to the volume measure of this maximizing method. Okay. And then we use this together with the, um, the sort of basic properties of the these free boundary minimal surfaces and the... Um, and the limiting guide is show right that the, the extensions, the harmonic extensions of these free boundary minimal surfaces to the disks now inside this closed guy, um, the harmonic extension is going to converge strongly in W12 to the, uh, the maximizing map that we want, the, the minimal immersion achieving the maximum value of the Boston right? okay. So uh, as I mentioned, it would be nice to get a more refined picture of how this convergence happens. And in particular, that's true in the cases like uh, S2, RP2, T2 in the Klein bottle, where we know explicitly what the maximizers are for the Laplacian problem. So if we can understand in a sort of refined way how this convergence happens, then we get the better and better picture of what the Steklov maximizers actually look like, which uh, previously is sort of uh, not really well understood at all. The Steklov maximizers are, I think, explicitly known um, only in a couple of cases, like the annulus and the Mobius fan. Um, and I'll mention that when the, the genus is zero or one, and then we have a similar result for RP2 or K, Using these quantitative stability results in a paper with, uh, with Nahon and Polterovich, we can get some nice estimates on the actual gap between these uh, Laplacian uh, maxima and the, uh, the uh, Steklov maxima. So in particular, we take the gap between the Laplacian maximum and the Steklov maximum with the R boundary components. This is going to be bounded below by log R over R. We think this might be sharp. We're still uh, trying to figure that out. Okay, so then finally I'll end with a question that's sort of unrelated to the uh, the spectral problems, but I think it's an interesting one for anyone in the minimal surface side of things, which is given a minimal surface in the boundary sphere, uh, under what circumstances can you find a sequence of free boundary minimal surfaces in the ball converging to it? Because again, somehow the convergence of these uh, this free boundary guys to the um, these closed guys in the boundary sphere is kind of an exotic and interesting behavior. Um, so we know this help happens for the uh, minimal surfaces arising from uh, the Laplace maximization problem now. But uh, does it happen, for instance, for the loss of surfaces in S3? Can you find free boundary guys in B4, which converge to it? Maybe by some fluing method or some uh, clever variation. So I think that would be interesting to understand. All right, but I'll uh, stop there for now. Thanks for your attention. Thank you very much, Daniel, for this beautiful talk. Uh, are there any questions? So there is one in the room uh, from Baptiste de Viver. Please. Thank you, uh, Daniel, first of all, for the talk. It was uh, really uh, great. Uh, I have a very small question concerning the, um, so the first theorem you spoke about uh, uh, for the, so the min-max uh, characterization by harmonic maps uh, yeah. of the first eigenvalue in the closed case. Is there a similar thing for the free boundary case? So the, the short answer is no in the sense that uh, um, you know, hasn't been thought about explicitly. My guess would be that there should be something similar, except instead of somehow harmonic maps into the um, into the sphere, you'd be looking at something like half harmonic maps from the boundary of the surface of the boundary into uh, into the sphere. Uh -huh. So somehow your your functional is going to be um, you know map your boundary curve into the sphere and then take the harmonic extension and look at the variational theory for that guy. And I would expect that something similar should, should be true and give you a, a max characterization of this deck block guy, but I'm not sure. Okay, thank you. Um, more questions? Okay, it doesn't seem the case. So thank you again for this uh, very exciting talk. Thanks for having me. And, and, and uh, so next talk is in exactly 30 minutes. Thanks, Daniel.
Thank you. you. Take care.